Before tomorrow's Chicago Tribune can be printed, there must be paper. And to make paper, there must be trees. Thus, actual production of tomorrow's Tribune begins in a wilderness on the north shore of the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Let us journey there, 1,200 miles from Chicago, into the north country to the forests of the province of Quebec, Canada. Here, the Chicago Tribune has acquired vast tracts of timberland, more than two million acres, about the equivalent of the combined area of the states of Delaware and Rhode Island, so that it will have a perpetual supply of trees for the manufacture of paper. Operations in the timberlands are continuous 12 months of the year. But in a sense, the cycle may be said to begin in the fall, when shiploads of supplies are taken from Quebec down the St. Lawrence River to Tribune towns on the rim of the wilderness. For once winter comes, there is no getting in or out except by airplane, for snow and ice form impassable barriers. In September and October, ships, some of them part of the Tribune fleet, others chartered for the purpose, carry a variety of stores down the broad St. Lawrence and across the Gulf to the towns and camps that lie on the edge of a wild frontier, east of the eastern boundary of the state of Maine. For half a year, such Tribune communities as this at Shelter Bay are frozen in and everything needed must be taken into the woods before ice seals the gates to the outside world. Shelter Bay, first of the communities to be built by the Tribune, is a thriving town on the Gulf, 400 miles northeast of Quebec, and with millions of acres of virgin forest as its backyard. So barren is the shoreline that ships must unload into scows and barges, which are then towed to shore. Cargoes consist of food, clothing and tools, sacks of cement and bales of hay, sugar and yeast, butter, molasses and beans, barrels of flour and hogsheads of salt pork, kitchen stoves, axes, candy, and a thousand other articles. Annual requirements, for example, run as high as two and a half million pounds of hay and oats, 330,000 pounds of potatoes, a quarter million pounds of flour, 140,000 pounds of pork, 900,000 cigarettes, and 7,000 pounds of tobacco. Shelter Bay, although an outpost of civilization with a population of only about 1,000, still has many big city conveniences, such as hot and cold running water, central heat, an efficient sewer system, electric lights, and a well-equipped hospital. Excellent educational facilities are provided by a thoroughly modern school. Knitting seems to be as popular as it is in Chicago, but bread is baked in an outdoor oven. No less hardy pioneers than the intrepid French explorers who sailed along these shores centuries ago, the woodsmen and their families enjoy life much as the people do in Chicago. Life is simple on the North Shore, but for both young and old, it is a full life. After the supplies have been brought down the river and across the Gulf from Quebec, the next task is to carry them by sledge, truck, and boat over land and across water to the various logging camps that lie back in what the loggers call the bush. Less than 20 years ago, this was an impenetrable wilderness. But today, through corduroy roads, boats, and bridges, the back country has been made accessible, and interior camps have been built at strategic points. Cash 2, base of one group of loggers and six months headquarters for the cutting crews, is about 20 miles from Shelter Bay on the southern tip of 30 Mile Lake. About it lies the forest primeval, mile after mile of rugged country, in which are great stands of timber awaiting the axe of the woodsman. In felling a tree, the first operation is to clear away the brush. Here is a lumberjack notching a tree on the side toward which he wishes it to fall. Next, he uses his saw on the opposite side. Then there's a shout of timber, and the tree topples and crashes. The small branches, or slash, are trimmed off and later are burned. Otherwise, they would dry out and constitute an invitation to the deadliest enemy of the forest, fire. No one is permitted to smoke in the woods, and all about a fire guard. After the tree has been cut into four foot lengths and stacked, the logs are carefully examined and stamped by the inspectors, or scalers as they are called. Spruce trees, balsam, birch, poplar, and mountain ash are found in Tribune timberlands. But only spruce and balsam are cut since they provide the best quality fibers for making newsprint paper. 
Every winter, more than two million trees are cut according to a carefully planned schedule. No tree is cut more than 18 inches above its base. No young trees are felled. And reforestation is encouraged, though it is accomplished by nature so efficiently that no prolonged assistance from man is required to promote regrowth. One day in the late autumn, the wind comes from the north, bringing snow and sending the mercury toward the bottom of the thermometer. Then until April, the north country is held in the unrelaxed grip of winter, with temperatures as low as 50 degrees below zero. Days are short, for not so far away is the Arctic Circle, and work must move along briskly. An important activity is that assigned to the cruising team. Traveling by dog sled, the men choose a site and pitch their tents. Then they go through the woods, measuring trees and marking those that are from 80 to 100 years old, and hence are ready for the woodsman's axe. Cache 2 is now wrapped in a fluffy blanket of snow, but the cabins are cozy and warm, and the food is plentiful. No need to call them twice. Swinging an axe in the woods in winter is guaranteed to work up a first-rate appetite. Not much dinner table conversation, but a wholehearted devotion to the matter at hand. Music is a popular entertainment. Chopping trees all day doesn't in the least detract from their enthusiasm for an hour or so of skiing. All through the winter, the harvesting of trees goes on in a race against the elements in order to cut the scheduled volume of timber before the coming of spring. Getting the timber out of the woods is a difficult problem. Some of the logs are transported by horse-drawn sleds to rivers and lakes, where they're piled on the ice to await the spring thaw. And where the banks of rivers and lakes are inaccessible to sleds, logs are sent tobogganing down icy chutes. With the end of winter, the waterways open to traffic, and life takes on a quickened tempo. Now the streams leap and roar, and the great harvest of logs, cut in the winter and piled on the ice, continues its journey from the forest to Shelter Bay and other towns built by the Tribune on the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Occasionally, the frozen logs are difficult to dislodge, and then dynamite is used to break the jam and send the timber on its way. At the mouth of the river, the logs are stopped by booms and fed onto conveyors which carry them to the barking drum. These are huge steel cylinders in which the logs revolve and toss against one another. By friction, the bark is removed and the logs emerge slick and shiny. Then they're conveyed to the waiting ships and piled in the holes and on the deck. At Franklin, a hundred miles or so southwest of Shelter Bay, is another Tribune town. Here, logs drop from a sluice directly into the ship's hold where crews arrange them in ship-shaped manner. A few miles farther south is Como Bay, the newest Tribune settlement, where the Tribune is building a new town, power plant, and paper mill. All during the navigation season, from June to October, ships are loaded and push off for the Tribune paper mill at Thorold, at the western end of Lake Ontario. The trip requires from a week to 10 days. During a single season, as much as 150,000 cords of pulpwood are shipped by boat from the timberlands to the mill where they're converted into newsprint paper. As soon as a steamer arrives at the mill, the logs are lifted from the hold by derricks. Then they're picked up by a chain conveyor and stacked in mountainous piles containing as much as 100,000 cords of wood. Such a reserve stock is needed since the Tribune consumes more than 2,000 tons of paper in a single week. Time was when the logs were handled by men. Then this ingenious device, the orange peel grab, was invented. Logs are now carried from the piles to the conveyors more quickly and with little hazard to the workmen. The grab picks up a load in its jaws, swings it around and deposits it onto the cable conveyor. At a transfer junction, the logs go on to another conveyor that carries them to rotating washing drums. Then they're discharged into a sorting conveyor and inspected by men who select logs for both mechanical and chemical processes. Newsprint used by the Tribune consists of approximately 25% chemical pulp and 75% mechanical pulp. 
Mechanical pulp gives paper the porous-like characteristics that enable it to absorb ink on high-speed newspaper presses. Chemical pulp gives it strength and flexibility. Logs that pass inspection are placed on the saw table and are cut to two-foot length. Those with slight defects are placed on the carriage of the woodpecker, a name given this machine by the Tribune engineers who developed it at the mill. All defects are removed before they move on. From the sorting conveyor, some logs go to the chipper, which reduces them to small chips, which are sent to the digester to be mixed with acids in the chemical or sulfite process. Complete control of chips and acid is maintained in the sulfite digester in order to obtain a uniform pulp. There is no deviation from the highest standards throughout the mill to ensure a superior grade of strong white paper. Logs for the mechanical process are placed in a battery of grinders, each of which can transform 12 cords of wood into high-grade pulp every 24 hours. The logs are forced under pressure against huge grindstones. Water flows over them continuously, and from the bottom of the machine issues a steady stream of pulp. At frequent intervals, samples are taken for analysis as a check on quality. Both mechanical and sulfite pulps are thoroughly combined in mixing tanks with chemicals to color and brighten the paper. The pulps are then beaten together, more water is added, and the mixture is pumped into the paper-making machine where it flows onto wire screens that form an endless belt. As it passes over the screens, the water drains off and the forward motion of the screens causes the pulp fibers to interlace and become paper. When the paper leaves the screen, it passes between two large rollers that squeeze out still more water. Then it goes through another series of rollers that squeeze and dry it further. Finally, it passes through 32 drying cylinders, filled with live steam and covered with blankets to absorb any remaining moisture. The final touch is given by steel calendar rollers that polish the paper and give it a smoother finish. Next, it is rewound on steel spindles and wrapped in extra heavy paper made at the mill from the coarser fiber screened from the newsprint pulp. Paper has been made from trees. The next step is to transport it from the paper mill to Tribune Tower. Into the hold of one of the Tribune's fleet of ships go the rolls of paper, weighing approximately 1,800 pounds each. Then across Lakes Erie, St. Clair, Huron, and Michigan, moves the parade of paper to Tribune warehouses near the mouth of the Chicago River. A few more steps and trees will have become Tribune. Thus, man's struggle with the elements comes closer to fruition. Soon, by the magic of printer's ink, that paper will live as a Tribune instead of a tree will become the pages on which will be recorded completely and without compromise the events of the day throughout the world. Here at the Tribune's own dock, the ships tie up and the rolls of paper are lifted from the hold to conveyors that take them in swift procession to the warehouses, where there is stored a stock of newsprint paper sufficient to satisfy the needs of several months. While the ships are being unloaded, some of the rolls are sent directly to Tribune Tower by tunnel. Rolls proceed from the ship by gravity to the tunnel in the warehouse, where they are carried down a steep incline by a cog railway. During the winter months, when navigation is impossible, thousands of tons of newsprint are removed from the warehouses. Heavy rolls are handled with ease by tiering machines that can be moved to any section of the warehouses. Paper is rolled from the stack to the machine that lowers the roll to a dolly on the tracks of the railway. The tunnel connecting the warehouse on the river's edge to Tribune Tower on Michigan Avenue is a quarter of a mile long and 60 feet underground. Hundreds of rolls of paper are moved every night at the rate of two a minute. They attain a speed of 35 miles an hour before they pass over a braking device that slows them down as they reach the unloading platform in the sub-basement of Tribune Tower. There, a mechanical tipping device unloads the rolls onto a ramp down which they move to an automatic elevator. The elevator is geared to the same speed of two rolls a minute, and so the paper moves continuously from the warehouse, through the tunnel, up the elevator, to the floor of the reel room underneath the presses. The empty dollies move automatically from the platform to a compressed air gun that starts them on their return trip through the tunnel to the warehouse. As the rolls are unloaded from the elevator onto the real room floor, they're carefully unwrapped and inspected and rolled onto press room dollies. On an average weeknight, the presses consume more than 275 rolls, representing 458,000 pounds of newsprint paper. 
Each reel holds three rolls of paper, and as fast as one roll is exhausted, pressmen fit a new roll into place and lock it into position. All this activity is characteristic of Tribune preparedness. Because lakes and straits are frozen in the winter months, the Tribune, by such methods, ensures the prompt production of millions of Tribunes every week the year around. Founded in 1847, the Tribune is Chicago's oldest newspaper. From its modest beginnings to its present service to the community and to the nation, it is an outstanding example of the American principle of private initiative. Within Tribune Tower, the staff goes about the daily business of producing a newspaper. Across the city desk passes the news of metropolitan Chicago to be scanned by the copy reader. Over this department presides the city editor, directing his forces so that the news of the day will be accurately reported, interestingly presented. From the press associations and hundreds of Tribune correspondents comes the news of the country by telegraph to be handled here. A similar desk is in charge of the cable editor, to whom comes news from outside the United States, sent by press associations and by Tribune correspondents in foreign cities. 24 hours a day, the cables bring the day's history as it is made and reported across the seas. Under the direction of the sports editor are experts who write the story of baseball and football, of golf and tennis, of horse racing and boxing, and all the other recreational activities of this sports-loving nation. Still another important department is that of finance and business, where trained writers present the news of markets and trade. Directed by the Metropolitan Editor are five separate neighborhood newspapers, which are a part of the Sunday Tribune. And here is the Sunday Room itself, a busy department, where under the direction of the Sunday Editor are many sub-departments and features. On all topics of special interest, writers keep Tribune readers well informed. Whatever is worthwhile in the arts and sciences is interestingly reported by trained observers. What are people the world over saying and doing that Tribune readers should know about if they are to live happier, richer, and more useful lives? Seeking to answer that all-inclusive question, such is the objective of Tribune reporters, cameramen, feature writers, and editors. And supervising these various men and women, each trained in his or her special field, are the assistant editor-in-chief and the managing editor, who coordinate their output into one harmonious whole. Ready for use by the writers is a splendidly equipped reference library and a reference file room containing more than 3 million clippings, 700,000 photographs, and 75,000 engravings. Long ago, the Tribune realized the value of pictures in bringing people and events vividly and unforgettably to its readers. And so, every day, scores of pictures are printed, some of them supplied by photographic services, some taken on the scene by Tribune photographers, and still others posed in the Tribune's completely equipped studio. Watched for, laughed over, vital characters in the lives of readers are Tribune comics. Sometimes as light in humor, but more frequently drawn to focus attention on a civic or national problem, the editorial cartoon is given front page position by the Tribune. To make the engravings from which Tribune illustrations are printed, the pictures to be reproduced, whether drawings or photographs, are placed before a camera in the engraving room. The shutter is snapped and the image is recorded on a sensitized negative glass plate. The light from a flaming arc transfers the image to the zinc plate. After it has been powdered with dragon's blood and heated, the zinc plate is etched in an acid bath. Removed from the bath, the plate is washed and goes to the router, a man with a sure eye and a steady hand who cuts away excess metal. It is then mounted on a metal base. Now the engraving of the cartoon or strip or photograph is ready for proofing in order that the artists, the editors, the engravers, and all others concerned may inspect the finished product. 